Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. A lot of us know about John and Paul, but among the viewers of my YouTube channel, people love George too, and we don't really know as much about him. So I bought the book George Harrison, The Reluctant Beatle by Philip Norman, and he was the same man who wrote the Beatles book Shout. So I'm going through the book to learn things that I didn't know and perhaps you didn't know either. So in the video, I'll kind of bounce around in the book and let you know what I found out. So it should be pretty interesting. So here's an early memory or two. George's sister Louise, who was 11 at the time, helped George in her arms when he was only eight hours old. She said she always remembered her mother's words, take care of him because he's going to be special. She was sure right about that. It is funny that George's father registered him at birth. He didn't consult Louise and he named him George. So George's father said, if it's good enough for the king, and the king at that time was George the sixth, then it's good enough for him. So George's father was working on the White Star Line, which was out at sea all the time before finally deciding to stay on land and drive buses. He was at first a conductor and then a driver, and he never made more than 7.5 pounds a week. But George said he never felt poor or deprived. He had loving parents who were happily married, he got along with his brothers and sisters, and he was always surrounded by uncles, aunts, and cousins. Harold, uh, George's father, was calm and orderly, while George's mother, Louise, was full of life and romanticism, which was in her Irish ancestry. She loved to laugh, loved a song, or a party. His sister, Louise, was nicknamed Lou, and because she was the oldest, she helped care for George. She never felt like it was a chore. She liked to dress him and take him for walks and bathe him, and when his turn came to bathe, uh, he was in a tin bath in front of the fire. He was scared of the outhouse, but Lou made it light of it and got him to laugh about it. So George, surprisingly, I didn't realize this, he wanted to be an architect. Uh, his interest wasn't music, it was architecture, and it ran in the family. Uh, George's paternal grandfather was a builder, and he put up several of the Edwardian houses in Princess Road, a secured area that at that time was for Liverpool's wealthiest merchants. When George was little, he felt an appreciation for buildings and how they looked, and he couldn't explain it to adults, but he had that appreciation for it. And George said, I always thought that life was to go through and grow and make opportunities, make things happen. I never felt that because I was from Liverpool, I shouldn't live in a big mansion house myself one day. So it sounds like he was practicing the secret making things come to him with positive thoughts and willing it to happen, and he sure made it work for him. So George was a Cub Scout when he first started school, and he was sociable and a stylish boy. But life in Liverpool had its risk. George said that you had to be careful not to look at someone funny because you could get a beating. And one day a, a noisy, helpless drunk fell, fell from the pavement into the Harrison's front door into the glass dim porch. Louise got rid of him by throwing a saucepan of cold water on him. So school time? George had a good memory, and he was also intelligent and perceptive, so he was able to win a scholarship. George could have done well at school, but he didn't like authority or being made to do something, so he didn't do very well on any subject at school except for art. Music didn't do anything for him there at the school because they only had the violin and the recorder as instruments, and at that time he was interested in architecture. So George wasn't openly rebellious, but he would hang out with people in a secluded alley off the playground. It was known as Smoker's Corner, and George wasn't old enough to smoke, but he did, and he smoked unfiltered cigarettes. So George had an ear for music. George's mom bought George two Hofner guitars, well, not all at once, but at different times. First he had uh, a Senator and then a Club 40. He wasn't a flashy player, but he had a musical ear. He could reproduce the riffs and solos of a latest skiffle hit just by hearing it a few times. The President guitar was bought at Hesse's Music Store, which was in central Liverpool, and the owner, Jim Gretty, offered free lessons after store hours. There would be about a dozen people in his class. Gretty played country and western music. And Gretty said that George couldn't get enough lessons. He said he was trying to have George to be like Hank Williams, but George wanted to be Chet Atkins teach himself how to play, he would listen to the same record over and over, and then he began to duplicate what he heard till he got it right. 
and his mother, Louise, would sometimes sit up with him till the early morning hours. But she didn't try to distract him. She would just be there for support. So John, when he started to art school, he started dating Cynthia Powell, and uh, he asked his bandmates what they thought of her, and they all approved, but George said bluntly that she had teeth like a horse. Uh, Cynthia heard George's comment and didn't know whether to laugh or cry. It was all forgiven when he sat beside her, looking like he was 11, and said, I wish I had a nice girl like you. So Paul and George's early friendship. When summer vacation came, Paul and George decided to go hitchhiking to down south, as it was called. They each had a small backpack, a basic tent, and a tiny portable stove. George said they lived on food from cans, and they would buy smedley spaghetti bolognese or milanese. And then they got as far south as Pangton and Devon, and they were half frozen sleeping on the beach, and they hitched to South Wales. Then they went to Chepstow, and then they were broke, and they asked the police if they could spend the night in a cell, but they said no, and they ended up on a wooden bench of the town's football field. Then they decided to go to a seaside town called Harlick, and they talked to a guy their age, and he said that they could pitch their tent in a field behind his parents' bungalow. It was pouring rain the first night, and the next night the boy's mom felt sorry for them, and they were invited to stay in the house, and they ended up spending a week there. Uh, they shared a double bed, and they were served three big meals a day. Uh, Paul and George didn't realize it, but they were staying in a and b <laughs> So George was upset when Paul and John took a trip and this was the time when the Beatles were back from Hamburg, and they were playing the Cavern Club. And at this time, the only one to get the first Beatle haircut after Stu did was George. And so it was John's birthday. A relative gave him 100 pounds, and John decided he wanted to hitchhike to Spain, and he asked Paul to join him. So they left without a word to Pete or George. So there were several important band-aids coming up at the same time. So when... John and Paul got to France. They said, forget about Spain and hitchhiking. So they took a train to Paris, and they spent a week with a friend named Jurgen Vollmer, and then they spent all of John's money. So their friend already had a haircut like Stu and George. So Paul and John asked him to cut their hair that way too. So George didn't display his feelings of disappointment or hurt, but he let it be known he was seeking a job with another band. So George was a concerned friend. When Stu died, John and George showed uh, Stu's fiance Astrid, the most kindness. John wanted to see the art studio that Stu had, and Astrid took him to the attic where he had his art equipment. So George was there, and John was sitting in a chair full of emotion about being in the room where his friend painted. Astrid said that George was getting worried, and Astrid said, just stand behind him. And Astrid took a picture of them and said, John was falling to bits there, and when you look at the picture, you see George's eyes, and they were so full of protection for John. So why wasn't George writing original songs? The Mersey Beats editor, Bill Harry, was uh, the one asking why George wasn't writing more original songs like John and Paul. So it was hard to compete with that duo. Paul was able to come up with song ideas out of the air. George at that time felt he could only come up with tunes, and he did do the song Cry for a Shadow, for example. George felt he didn't have the ability to come up with words to songs, so Bill Harry had suggested that George and Ringo try writing in a partnership, but George didn't want to do that. In 1963, George was having chronic fatigue, so a doctor stated he needed to stay in bed at the hotel. I didn't realize it, but George at that time had a friendship with Astrid, who was living in Hamburg, and he wrote her a long letter to her saying that he felt like John and Paul were going to be rich very soon when they collected what they earned from writing all those songs together. And he thought he could make some extra money by putting together a book illustrated with her photographs, because as he wrote to her, I don't think you want to see me poor and hungry. So this is the time he decided to do an exercise to see whether he could write a song and the song was Don't Bother Me, and that's a song I've always loved. So George was mad for Ringo. In June of 1964, when the Beatles were about to go to Copenhagen, Ringo was rushed to the hospital with tonsillitis and pharyngitis. Brian felt like the tour couldn't be postponed, and they hired a drummer named Jimmy Nickel to play with the band until Ringo recovered. 
Ringo didn't say anything, but George was so angry. Decades later, he said, Can you imagine the Rolling Stones going out on tour and saying, Oh, sorry, Mick. Mick can't come. We'll just find someone else to replace him for two weeks. I really despise the way that we couldn't make a decision for ourselves. The friendship between George and Eric, uh, when Clapton played on George's Wonderwall soundtrack and album, they began to hang out together. George and Eric didn't do much guitar playing together. They would talk together for hours, and they would often go off together. And Clapton remembered that what it was like being in the golden light when he went somewhere with George. And George said he envied Clapton's ability to go from one band to another without being chained to a public image like he was. And now we have George and Yoko. In 1968, John brought Yoko to the studio. John had her sit next to him, and he would ask her opinion before his bandmates or George Martin on a song he was doing. And Yoko stated that she thought John had told them some sort of sob story, and he wanted to be there to cheer her up. So Yoko said, George came over and said, hello, how are you? George said he didn't think Yoko liked them because she saw the Beatles as something between John and her. But Yoko had a different spin on it. She said John insisted on her being there every day because of his own jealousy and insecurity. He was afraid to let her out of his sight for a moment, afraid that she would have an affair with one of his bandmates. Yoko said there was a story that she followed him into the bathroom but she said he made her go there with him. So Yoko said the group was nice to her. George was very nice, but sometimes he was very frank, and it could be very hurtful. That's just George, John would tell her. So I'll stop the video here, and it was neat to find out new information that I didn't know about George and his life. And I will do some more uh, looking into the book to see if there's anything else that you might find interesting. So I hope you all enjoy the video. And if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. So I wish everyone a good day and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.